Anoop is saying hi. So, uh, उल्लासिल <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah, you know, I can see that in a nice cup. Yeah, they can see that. The coffee is also very good. Yeah, that I think. Yeah. As photo, you'll have to send it via. As chair, that. Nambudri, please start the proceeding, Doctor Nambudri. Okay, okay. Let's let's uh, start. Uh, Chandar, please put everybody on the mute. Everybody on mute. Yeah, welcome to the web series, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Vijayaraman will join in as uh, as he can get connected. So, Dr. Namudri, you as the moderator, please take can over. Can you hear me? Or... Let's start. Can you hear me? Yes, Hi. we can hear you. Okay. So. Hi, Dr. Vijayaraman. Welcome. How are you? Thank you. Good, thank you. So, Dr. Vijay Raman has joined us. Dr. Vijay Raman and Dr. Namudri, please start the session. And Chandar, I request you to put everybody on mute except for the speaker, the moderator, and Dr. Saxena. Okay, ma'am. Hi, this so, is uh, Dr. Vijay Raman. Uh, I'm attending the seminar. Vijay, how are you? Time. So, I'll let Dr. Namudri take over. <laughs> And then, can you hear us? And then, he probably I, having some connection I, problem. He's got his connection. Why don't you take this? Uh, can we have? Why don't you take this? I can. I can. So, it's a pleasure to welcome Vijay once again with us. And uh, I think I will request uh, Dr. Shanmuga to start his presentation, and then we can have the discussion. Dr. Shanmuga, please. to thank uh, ihrs for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, let me say a big thanks to uh, manita ma'am and uh, sachena sir for organizing such a beautiful event to spend a uh, good time uh, in the lockdown period so as uh, usual uh, i prefer to present on lab branch pacing so when sir asked uh, to present about something i immediately say sir i present something about lab branch pacing so we have uh, uh, good uh, data on hitman branch pacing that uh, it works beautifully well in all uh, varieties of triadic treatment but uh, why lebman branch pacing uh, lebman branch pacing uh, the problem with hitman branch pacing are the main advantages of lebman branch pacing so we know that the his we are targeting a very very narrow target so so probably of uh, 2 plus 4 mm in dimension and we know that on the lead dislodgement rate is going to be around uh, 5 to 7 percentage acutely and on follow up additional 10 to 15 percentage can have a rising threshold and uh, once we are programming it as a higher uh, output so we have the problem of early battery depletion so another important problem is while correcting uh, white qrs there is uh, probably 60 70 percent chance that the hitman is going to correct and 30 to 40 percent of the time we may end up in a failure so these are the problems with hitman pacing which are big advantages for the hitman branch pacing how to define so any scientific uh, terminology needs some definitions so lebman branch pacing is defined as a, a capture of the left bundle so either it may be the main bundle per se or its uh, uh, particular branches along with some sort of septal uh, myocardial capture so the output threshold output should be less than 1 mole to 0.5 milliseconds per phase so it's not all rbbb variety of uh, uh, pace qr as morphology belongs to lebman branch pacing so we have certain criteria to confirm that we have captured the left bundle and not the septal myocardium so there are probably four or five criteria which has to be satisfied before confirming that it is lb be captured the first and foremost is uh, the pace qr as morphology since we are capturing the left bundle so obviously our pace qr is going to produce some sort of right bundle branch connection delay so that should be either uh, qr or rs or lead b1 the second important thing is demonstration of left bundle potential so if there is any activation 
anti-grade activation of left bundles, the potentials will be demonstrated on the EGM. And uh, peak left ventricular activation time, I'll be telling in subsequent slides so how to calculate this peak LVAT. So that should be less than 80 milliseconds. And uh, we should be able to demonstrate this non-selective to selective or non-selective to LV septal capture while doing the decremental KC. Of course, the last one, which is very important and often, often neglected thing is program stimulation. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, ha I'm having a one good slide to demonstrate how to do this program stimulation. Let us see it one by one. So before going into the procedure per se, so we should know what exactly the cardiac conduction anatomy is looking like. So the his bundle per se is divided into two portions. One is the penetrating portion of his bundle. Another one is branching portion of his bundle. So this is the penetrating portion of the his bundle, which penetrates the, uh, uh, this uh, AV ring and enters into the crust of the septum. So at the crust of the septum, we have the branching portion. So we can see here, the fibers of the bundle is actually branching much earlier than the true branching point. This encircled point is the branching point. In fact, the fiber starts, starts branching out from the main his bundle much earlier than the true branching point. So obviously this area often is considered as a branching point. It's often, it's actually a pseudo branching point because we have left anterior vesicular, posterior vesicular fibers, which branches out much earlier. And uh, RBBB is of course considered as a direct continuation of the his bundle. And we can see uh, the yellow fibers, which are predestined fibers for right bundle, and the red fibers, which are predestined fibers for the left bundle. In fact, we can see it visibly, though it is on diagram, we can see it visibly that the his bundle it's somewhat a narrow bundle as compared to a broad fascicle. So the area to target is somewhat broad as compared to the head bundle. This procedure, uh, in fact, uh, it's the same as the uh, bundle. So we have the same lead, this uh, Medtronic 3830 Select Secure uh, uh, 4.1 French lead. It's an MRI compatible lead. And in India, we have only C315 sheath catheters. And the deflectable catheter is yet to be available probably in a month or so. This uh, deflectable catheter will also come into the market. Uh, regarding this lead, I want to stress some important points regarding the lead. So this uh, uh, helix is around 1.8 millimeter, and from the helix to the anode, this inter-electrode distance is going to be around 9, 9 millimeter. So when you add these two things together, this inter-electrode distance along with the helix, this comes around 10.8 millimeter. So this is very, very important while doing left bundle facing because while giving torsion or while giving torque, so we must know exactly how deep the lead is going in. So for that, we should know the intraventricular septal thickness and the radio opaque portion of the lead. So if we, if we have a good idea about both these things, then there is a high chance that we will avoid perforating the intraventricular septum. Otherwise, uh, the procedure is almost uh, uh, like a his bundle. Only thing, uh, we are screwing it little distally into the intraventricular septum. So this is how uh, the procedure will be done in a nutshell. So many times I usually put a catheter from the groin to have a, a good his bundle anatomy. So while doing the placement of catheter from the groin, use the map how distal the his bundle signals that we are getting and uh, take a fluorocine and keep it as a radio, radio, radiological landmark. Then we can work from the uh, left infraclavicular region, put the CA315 sheath along with sheath 315 sheath along with the lead probably go 1 to 1.5 centimeter below the distal his bundle signal and uh, before turning go to elevo so that you'll be able to see the movement of the lead uh, exactly how deep the lead is going in. So while uh, screwing or while giving the rotation, monitor the QRS morphology, duration, unipolar impedance and of course uh, LVAT. So the LVAT, uh, the recommended limit is probably between 75 to 80 milliseconds. Once everything is done, do a contrast angio probably with 2 to 3 ml in a labor view and see how deep the lead is in, then peel away the sheet. So this is uh, what I was talking about. So for positioning the sheet, so probably we need to know the distal extent of the his bundle signal. So this, we can get it from a catheter from the groin, or we can use the same sheet along with the, along with the lead and map the his bundle region, tag the distal most extent of the his signals, and then draw an imaginary line connecting this uh, distal extent of the his bundle towards the RVFX. Then our target area should be roughly around 1 to 1.5 centimeter below the distal extent of the his bundle. So this is the area where exactly we'll be uh, working around. So what we have to do is we will do pace mapping and see how
how the QRS morphology is looking like on the right side of the chart. And let us assume that our lead is here. I am doing a page map here. So the leads which we have to look for uh, 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 while doing page mapping are the lead V1, which should show a characteristic W pattern like here, and lead 2 should be predominantly positive, and lead 3 should be biphasic. So this is what the target zone should have while doing a page mapping. So then, gradually, we have to give rotation till, hello, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Yeah, so because some, some message was coming, I'm not connected. So anyway, so while giving the tar, gradually we have to see the QRS morphology, how it goes in. So you can see the notch here. Once I give some one or two turns, the notch is going up here. And after two or three turns, when my lead reaches the mid septum, I can see some sort of shortening of the QRS along with the notch has gone up now. So when I give some more turns, you can see the notch has formed an R wave here and my lead is right on the top of the lead bundle. So once you're right on the top of the left bundle, one thing is you'll be able to see the QR pattern here. You'll be able to see a narrow QRS, paste QRS. And if you have any anti-grade condition of the left bundle, you'll be able to see the characteristic left bundle potential. So this is the his bundle potential, the interval. Usually we know it is between 35 to 55. The left bundle potential, the usual interval will be between 20 to 30 milliseconds. And once we got the potential and there is no use of giving further turns, we got a good QRS, we got a good QR pattern, we got a good potential, then probably we have to take a sheath angio and peel away the sheath. There is no use of giving further rotation if we are having such a sharp and beautiful left bundle potential. Further rotations are going to just produce perforation, just stop, do the angio and come out. Sometimes while it's cluing, we'll be able to see some sort of uh, ectopics. So this is very commonly observed whenever we are disturbing the septum. So we are screwing the septum deep. So if we are getting a VPC or ectopic, exactly mimicking the phase QRS, during phase QRS morphology. Like here you can see, in screwing I got two ectopics, and this ectopic is exactly mimicking, mim mimicking my phase QRS, this classical RSR pattern, probably with a narrow QRS. And if I measure the activation time, this will be sharp. So if you are getting Probably this may give an indirect clue that you may be right on the top of the left bundle. So further turns can be avoided if you are getting a VPC morphology exactly mimicking, mimicking the phase QRS morphology. So first thing, uh, phase QRS QR morphology, we have seen QR should be there. The second thing, left bundle potential, we have demonstrated. And the third important thing is peak left ventricular activation. In fact, uh, this is the most important thing which will decide how deep you have to go into the septum. Let's see here, this is my groin hispanic catheter signals, this is my pacing lead signal, and my lead is somewhere here, closer to the left bundle, and uh, when I start seeing the signal, I can see a, a shallow low frequency potential here, which is probably the left bundle potential, but it is very shallow, it is a very low frequency, and when I pace, I got a QRS duration of around 110, but still I'm not happy with the LVAT. The LVAT was 85 milliseconds. So what you have to do is, you pace at high voltage and low voltage differentially and see how the LVAT and QRS duration differs. Suppose if you're pacing at 10 voltage and if your LVAT is 65 milliseconds and while pacing at two voltage like this, if your LVAT is 85 milliseconds, that means that you are still not on the top of the left bundle. You are probably closer to the left bundle area so what you have to do is you give further half a turn or one turn. So from here, I give half a turn and my lead land right on the top of the left bundle. I can see the potentials here, which is very sharp and which is very of high frequency amplitude. And you can see the LPAT has shortened from 85 to 65. So this is the very important thing of measuring the LPAT. So this will tell you where your lead is, whether you are closer to the left bundle area or you are right on the top of the left bundle area and it will guide you in assessing the penetration. Suppose if you have reached this target numbers, an LVAT of less than 80 to 80 milliseconds, and uh, probably a good potential, then no further turns are required, because further turn will produce only perforation. So this is very important while doing the procedure, measuring the LVAT at two different voltages. The fourth thing, so demonstration of non-selective to selective capture. So you can see here, this is the pace QR, which is looking like somewhat like a QR. If you see the pacing 
lead electrogram, you can see a pacing artifact immediately followed by a ventricular electrogram. But once the output is reduced from 0.6 volt to 0.5 volt, you can see this pacing spike followed by somewhat an isoelectric interval and then your local ventricular EGM. So you can see the clear difference of morphology of the EGM here to EGM here. There is a clear cut isoelectric uh, segment which, which actually uh, uh, differentiates your uh, non selective to selective capture. Simultaneously, you will be able to see the change in QRS morphology here. So here it is a QR which is now, you can see a small R wave here. So this from QR, it is changing to RSR pattern. So this usually will be seen in a very, very low output uh, uh, output phasing conditions. So like we are reducing from 0.6 volt to 0.5 volt, so you'll be able to demonstrate this. So if you're able to demonstrate this finding from a non-selective to selective capture, then probably you are right on the top of the love bundle and this confirms that you have captured the love bundle selectively. So another important thing to remember is we have two electrodes on the lead tip. One is the anode and another one is the cathode. We know the helix is the cathode. And the anode is uh, somewhat nine millimeter away from the uh, cathode. Uh, so this anode, so once you are screwing the lead in, many a times will be inside the septum. So like an average engine septal thickness is somewhere around 10 to 12 millimeter. So if you are screwing the lead, so many a times your anode will be touching the septum. So it is always better to measure what the anodal threshold captures capture threshold is. So this will help, help us in probably programming our PG in a later stage. Like here you can see, when I'm, so when I'm doing a, a threshold checking in a bipolar mode, you can see the morphology of uh, QRS here, which is predominantly QS, and now it is changing once the anode capture is lost to probably an RSR pattern. This is because here your anode is capturing, and once the anode has lost its capture, it is only a predominant capture of the left bundle system. Similarly, you can see here, there is a pacing artifact without any isoelectric interval. The immediately the electrogram, the electrogram is following. Here you can see some sort of isoelectric uh, uh, interval followed by the ventricular local EGM. So this will also help us in uh, final programming. So this plays a major part by programming on the case of the EGM LBBB where you may be utilizing the anodal capture for correcting the RP delay which was created. So that will uh, come in the later slides. So we have uh, seen four of the uh, important uh, criteria. This is the fifth one and probably is a confusing one. Just, uh, I'll just go through the uh, figure from here. I'm pacing the left bundle lead tip, doing a simple program stimulation. So 600, 600, 600, 330. So you can see the paced QRS morphology. So I'm, I'm stimulating from the left bundle. Hello. Yeah, hello. hello. I, am I audible, ma'am? Yeah, uh, ah, yeah, you are audible, but your screen has, we have lost your screen. Please go back to your screen. Uh, you have to do screen sharing again. Okay. Dilunga, can you go back to your screen sharing? Yeah, yeah. Now it is coming, ma'am? Yeah. Uh, it is, yeah, it is, it is apparently now. Yes. Yeah, you can open up your slide. Coming live. Okay. Yes, great. Go to the slide show, please. Yeah. Yeah. So here I'm pacing from the lead tape. So you can see the pace QRS morphology here. So if you're gradually reducing the, uh, the S2, so what at particular point you can see at 320 milliseconds, it is a typical RSR pattern. At 310 milliseconds, it is somewhat like a QS pattern. So this means that here you are capturing the left bundle plus probably some sort of septum and here your septum is capturing there is no left bundle capture. This means that your lead is still on the right on the top of the left bundle. Here it is producing a left bundle capture. Here it is losing left bundle, losing left bundle capture because you have reached the left bundle refractory period. So this will again confirm in those patients where you are not able to demonstrate all of the criteria that you have captured the left bundle. This is one way of confirming a selective capture of left bundle by demonstrating programmed stimulation from the left bundle lead tape. And you can see the typical change in morphology. Here we can see the loss of capture of both septum as well as the left bundle. So there is no QRS. So until this point, the left bundle was conducting. Here only myocardium was conducting. And here only your, uh, there is no capture at all. So this, this program stimulation is very useful. One, to demonstrate your left bundle uh, refractory period. Second thing, to confirm uh, your uh, 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 
uh, capture of selective capture of lug bundle as opposed to pure septal capture. So this is uh, uh, this five criteria. The one should be like the pace QRS morphology of QR pattern should be there along with any one of the all other four criteria will confirm you have captured the lug bundle. So almost 80 to 90 percent of the time you'll be able to do the procedure without much difficulty. But in at least 20 percent of the time you may be facing some difficulties in doing the late DC. The problem may be one thing is uh, uh, you're not able to localize the area perfectly. So what I usually do is I'll go to RAO to start with. So I always keep my uh, hismal catheter to localize the dislexion of the base. Then I'll keep my pacing sheet just one and a half centimeter below the uh, hismal region and do the pace mapping. This pace mapping uh, of this W pattern may not be seen in all cases. So many times you may be we may have to go by anatomical approach of targeting that one and a half centimeter area. Because in patients with uh, uh, probably a uh, young patient with, uh, uh, with a normal left ventricular function, there may be a rapid condition of the septum where you will not be able to see the W pattern. So W pattern is not mandatory, uh, but probably you can target anatomically that uh, one to one and a half centimeter area. Another important thing is it's always better to screw at a rapid go rather than giving turn by turn. Though uh, Huang has described this at, uh, at as uh, giving probably one turn, look for the QR morphology pacing impedance, and then give further turns. Many times we may stuck up in between while giving the turns. So what I usually do is I'll go to elevo uh, so that my sheath faces perpendicular to the septum, and I'll start screwing. So I know the numbers here. The helix is 1.8, and the inter electrode is 9 millimeters. So totally this length is going to be 10.8 millimeters. So what I'll do is I'll measure the septal thickness before the procedure. If suppose the septal thickness is 11 millimeter, I'll make sure that this anode tip reaches the sheath tip. The sheath tip corresponds to the interventricular septum. So I'll make sure that this anode tip reaches the sheath tip. I'll stop screwing. I'll measure the parameters. So further turns will be given only if it is indicated based on the LVAT measurements. So the most and uh, probably the very important step is to keep the sheath exactly perpendicular to the septum. You can see here, this is the septum, and my sheath is exactly perpendicular to the septum. Sometimes, because of some basal septal scar, you may not be able to capture uh, the left bundle because the lead will not go deep in. So like in this case, where this is my distal uh, hismal signal, and uh, the uh, target area, uh, the probably an ideal target area is going to be this area. But since this area was uh, probably scarred, so I went down a little bit, and screwed there, I got a beautiful fascicular potential. So this has captured still the cardiac conduction system. So if you have any difficulty in capturing the left bundle because of basal septal scar, you can always go down and capture the fascicle. Anterior fascicle is very difficult because it is something like a thin tendon-like structure which goes towards the anterior papillary muscle. But the posterior fascicle is almost like a left main bundle. So it has a broad plan of fibers. So if you are not able to capture the left bundle, probably we can target the left posterior fascicle. So we know that this left bundle pacing is going to create a right bundle branch delay. So there is still a theoretical risk of uh, uh, producing interventricular dysentery because you are pacing the left ventricle. The left ventricle is going to contract at a much earlier stage and it is producing RBBB. So this theoretical risk of interventricular dysynchrony can be corrected by simple programming. So what you have to do is, we have already described regard, discussed regarding this anodal capture. So this anode is on the right side of the IVF. The cathode, which is right at the top of the lug bundle, is on the left side of the IVF. So if you are going to capture both simultaneously, then you will be able to uh, probably uh, correct that RBB. So another thing is along the native AV nodal condition. Suppose if you are doing spacing for uh, LBBB, so you can keep the spacing output and the AV delay accordingly that the right ventricle will be activated via your AV node, via right bundle, right bundle. And your left ventricle will be activated by the pacing node. So you can always use the native AV node to fuse the impulse and to mask that RBV pattern. Sometimes the RBV may be so marked that you will not be able to mask it by both anodal capture as well as the native solution. In that case, probably you can put an additional lead in the RV septum to fuse both together to create a normal peak to RS. So I'll give examples for each of the things. This is one particular case where LBT was done for uh, uh, lemonal branch. Uh, LV dysfunction. So you can see this paste QRS at an output of 1.5 volt at an AV delay of 70 milliseconds has produced complete RVV pattern. You can clearly see in V1 and V2 it is it's like a right muscle management delay. 
said, I've just increased the AV delay from 70 to 90 milliseconds and increased the output to 2 volt. My annual capture threshold was 1.75. So I've increased the output to 2 volt and increased the AV delay to 90 milliseconds. You can see the RB pattern is completely vanished. It is almost looking like a normal appearing QR. So this is because one, my anode is capturing probably on the right side of the IBS and the AV node is all conducting via right bundle into the right bundle. So this will produce almost a normal appearing QR. So this anode capture and native fusion will help us in masking this RB pattern. In some cases, if the RB is very masked in this case, we tried, to, we, we actually this uh, patient had a, a CRT pulse generator, so there was no problem for us to put one more lead. So we tried all sort of combinations uh, with anodal as well as the AV nodal uh, fusion, but we could not mask this RV. So we ultimately connected that additional RV septal lead, and you can see how beautifully the QRS has changed from RV VB to almost normal appearing QRS. So this is how we can uh, always mask this RV VB to create a beautiful looking QRS so that the ventricles are contra contracting in a synchronized way. The clinical implications, so it can be done for any bradyarrhythmia, be it a sinus node dysfunction like here where the patient had associated AV nodal disease, or in fact a complete heart block uh, like here where the QRS duration is almost 90 milliseconds normal appearing QRS. But the main interest is as a replacement for CRT. In a country like India where the people cannot afford a triple chamber CRT, suppose if it is going to work well, then we can use always this dual chamber pulse generator to connect to a left bundle lead, to connect the left bundle lead to the ventricular port and it will lead to the RA port and use it as a C replacement for CRT. Like a few of the cases where the EF was from somewhere around 30 to 35 percentage, you can see how beautifully the QRS is changing from a normal QR, baseline LBV appearing QRS to uh, RBV like uh, QRS immediate post implantation. And uh, probably at the end of 10 to 15 days, the EF has improved and by the end of two months, the QRS is almost normalized because of native AV nodal conduction as well as some sort of anodal capture and the EFS almost normalized. So this, if it is going to work, then it is a big boon for the Indian population. So it works even in patients with a hugely dilated LV, like in this case, where in both the patients, the LV was more than 70 millimeter. We could bring down the QRS to less than 100 milliseconds. And sometimes rarely in patients where the QRS is uh, almost 220 milliseconds with a very dilated LV, uh, you can even uh, get a good left bundle capture. This I struggled a lot, almost in half of placing, placing the left bundle lead, but ultimately I got a QRS of 124 milliseconds. So reducing it from 220 milliseconds to 120 milliseconds, it's actually good for the patient, especially when you're putting a dual chamber PG. This, of course, uh, this is uh, uh, the combination which uh, many times you'll be getting. At least DCM patient referred for CRT, you do an angio, you find some lesion, so obviously we have to revascularize this patient. This particular patient had an osteal uh, lesion extending up to the distal middle lady. So I had to do a stenting uh, from the left wing to the lady, waited for three months, and then uh, do the procedure. So this was done last month and he's doing well, and I hope that his EF will improve. Uh, this is our uh, single center experience. Uh, around uh, 99 patients we have attempted, out of which 93 we could succeed. And the follow-up period average is around 4.8 months, and the average age, age is around 62 percentage, and I bet is 69 percent. The main thing is LV dysfunction. So almost 58 percentage of our patient population had an EF of less than 50 percentage. So as per uh, uh, pacing guidelines, these are the patients for whom a CRT is indicated. So if uh, this target populations are doing is, are going to do well with the, this modality of uh, treatment, then probably the physiological, physiological pacing has a long way to go. Among the pacing indications, 6 sinus syndrome is only 9%. The predominant is AV block and uh, cardiac desynchronization therapy. This includes patients with uh, DCM LBVB and DCM RBVB. Four of the patients had AV nodal ablations done for uh, past ventricular rate. Uh, fluoroscopic time uh, is little longer than our routine RV lead. It's around 22 minutes, and the total fluoroscopy is around uh, 28 minutes. And sheath and G, I could do it in almost 56 patients. The rest, pa rest of the patients I didn't do because of the prolonged procedure. And uh, I don't want to uh, embolize a clot from the sheath into the pulmonary circulation. I didn't do. The baseline QRS was around 144 milliseconds. The baseline QRS morphology was LBVB in 38, 12 had RBVB, and 7 had IBC. Potentials were seen in 40% uh, of the cases, and these were all the patients where anti grade left bundle activation was there. So, in those patients who have anti grade activation, we'll be able to demonstrate left bundle potential. So, all patients except uh, Infra ECN complete heart blocks and complete LBBB, where there will not be anti activation, you will not be able to see the level potential.
the average potential duration to the surface QR is around 25 milliseconds and the post phase QR is from the 144 milliseconds we could reduce it down to 110 milliseconds. The LVAT average is around 72.5 milliseconds. And the, and the, the accepted number is around 80 milliseconds, but in some patients with severe reptonticular hypertrophy or if there is associated scar, we can even have an LVAT of up to 90 milliseconds. So threshold as compared to his bundle is very, very less. It's around 0.6 volt. The annual capture threshold is around 2 volt, and the sense star wave will be very good as compared to his bundle facing. It's around 14 millivolts. And impedance, this is very, very important. So unipolar impedance, always we have to measure the unipolar impedance while doing the procedure. If the unipolar impedance is less than 500 ohms, it's better to avoid that site and pull out the lead and put it at some other site. Because an unipolar impedance of less than 500 implies that probably our helix is exposed into the LV cavity. So it's better to avoid that site, just pull out the lead and put it at a fresh site. So we never accept an impedance of less than 500 ohms. If it is there, it's better to replace the lead, reposition the lead. So our baseline EF was around 44 uh, percentage. And the average Indian septal thickness, which I was pointing, was around 10 to 11 millimeter. The same thing uh, was there in our cohort also. The lead depth, we usually measure it in LAO position by doing sheet angio, or the simple thing, do a post procedure echo, measure the sheet angio in short axis. That will give you a better idea. And none of the patient had a worsening of LVF, uh, no uh, 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 acute uh, complications. One patient had mortality that was uh, related to sepsis, unrelated to the procedure. And this is very important. Over a period of uh, one to 12 months follow-up, uh, the threshold remained the same. You can see from 0 0.59, 0 0.57, there's no the p-value is not significant. The R-wave remained the same. And the impedance as expected has uh, gone down from 679 to 607. So that was significant. And the most important things are these two, where we could reduce the QRS from 144 to 110, and the EF has improved from 44 to 53. So this is very important, these two things. So if, if uh, LBBP or his bundle facing, uh, as a therapy is going to evolve, this is a big boon for a, uh, for a developing countries like India where people cannot afford a uh, triple chamber CRT. If the job can be done within a dual chamber pacemaker, then uh, of course physiological pacing has a long way to go. But word of, word of caution, this procedure was started in 2017 by Dr. Wang, so long term data is yet to be available. And of course, the lead is not meant for uh, doing a left, septal, a left bundle pacing. It's actually a, a site selective septal pacing lead, which is in the market since uh, 2015, sorry, 2005. And it has been adapted for doing a left bundle pacing. So again, uh, uh, the data, uh, uh, usually uh, we have to gain some more data uh, for regarding the safety aspect of the lead. And of course, potential complications are there, which has to be kept in mind, like lead dislodgement, late lead dislodgement into the left ventricular cavity, thromboembolism, and there is a big question, uh, lead extraction. So still, uh, we don't have data on lead extraction. Of course, we have data on lead extraction for right bundle pacing, but for left bundle pacing, the lead extraction data is not yet available. So we have to wait, uh, we have to keep our fingers crossed for uh, gaining this data before uh, concluding that this is uh, the most wanted procedure. I'll break for some time to have some discussion before going into interesting cases. It's open for discussion. Hi, uh, Sean. Well, I think, uh, yeah. That was a beautiful presentation. Uh, very complete, uh, detailed uh, presentation on the procedural methodology. And more importantly, I think some of the confusion out there in it because it's an evolving field, uh, wh what are we trying to achieve? Is it are we trying to do left septal facing or left bundle branch facing? And I think you clearly um, showed what the criteria for left bundle branch capture is, which is probably should be the goal in a majority of patients. Although left septal facing may be adequate in some patients. Um, and there are some exceptions. These criteria are still evolving, and I think it's a very, very nice presentation there. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I just want to make uh, some, uh, a few comments on to, uh, on the criteria. So when we do, this is just observational findings that we've seen. When we do uh, deep septal pacing, and if you're able to get into the proximal one, one and a half centimeters. Sometimes uh, anatomical variation, there is a distal left bundle there, and sorry, distal his bundle. So you can still get a normal looking QRS, 
almost same as a native uh, narrow QR. So you may not have a QR pattern. And so the criteria that we have outlined is that you need to have a, a R prime in most of these patients. And again, if you have left septal capture, there's generally most regions will have a, a R prime. But if you're in a little bit of an enteroseptum in the LV outflow tract region, there you may not see, you may still have a right bone, uh, left bone branch pattern rather than a QR pattern. So there are some exceptions, um, but you have to try to use as many criteria as possible to convince yourself that you are in the left bone branch region. Um, while in a traditional bradycardia pacemaker patients, uh, left septal pacing may be adequate as you get the adequate QRS narrowing and the conduction into the conduction system will only take about uh, 20 milliseconds at the most. Uh, so you get in rapid activation of the LV septum and the LV lateral wall fairly quickly. Where it may make a huge difference is in patients with cardiomyopathy. I think it's important that we have proof that left bundle branch capture is there, which is the harder one to do because you don't have anterograde uh, left bundle conduction, no potential. And so you need to pay attention to the other criteria. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, great Mukha. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm Hello. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Very nice. Very nice presentation. Yeah. Uh, there are a few queries from the uh, audience. I mean. Uh, one yes, question is, uh, can you explain the program stimulation again regarding the sure, left capture? Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Yeah. And in addition to that, I would like to ask how important is this pro program electrical stimulation of the left bundle? Uh, this is very important in those cases. Yeah, so this is very important in those patients where we are not able to demonstrate other criteria. Like you have a QR pattern, like Hiram uh, was telling, this QR pattern will be there even in left septal capture. It may not be a left bundle branch capture. So uh, if, if our other criteria is not, are not fulfilling, like uh, your LVAT is like borderline falling in the gray zone, and you're not able to demonstrate this uh, uh, non-selective to selective uh, transmission of this QRS morphology, as well as the local ventricular diagram, so in, the, in those cases, probably this program stimulation is going to work. So like here, so it's simple thing. It's just like doing an induction protocol for all HL or ventricular arrhythmias. Choose or select your uh, left bundle lead as a pacing modality, pacing uh, uh, port, and start giving uh, extra stimuli. So like here, I'm starting here. These are all paced QRS morphology from the left bundle lead tip. So I started from 600, 330. So I've given 600, 330. You can see the QRS morphology here. So this is 600, 320. You can see still just follow lead V1 alone. Forget about other leads. Still there are a lot of changes in other leads, but follow this lead V1. So at 320, still you have this RSR pattern from 330 to 320. But in 300, you can see it is a simple QS pattern. So here there is no R prime. It's just a QS. So this indicates that here there is no conduction system capture. It captures only the left ventricular septum. And uh, once you have reduced it still further, here it is capturing only the, it, it is not capturing at all. So that means that your left bundle uh, refractive period is somewhere around 320, and your uh, septal myocardial refractive period is around 310. So this is the usual thing which uh, people have observed. The left bundle refractive period, the septal myocardial refractive period will be little, which it has a good conductivity as compared to the left bundle, and both will be in and around 280 to 320 milliseconds. Probably Vijay Raman sir can add some more points. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so of all the criteria, this is actually the most challenging one. Uh, for me, sometimes it, uh, it may not always give us the right answer. A uh, couple of reasons. One is um, just looking at V1 alone may not be adequate uh, Schoenmuller syndrome uh, because you, you, the other criteria that I look at it is I look at the peak LV activation time, whether that changes. It, there should be a sudden change of at least 20 milliseconds. One of the problems with program stimulation is that as you become more and more premature, the QRS will get slightly wider. The peak activation time might slightly prolong because of uh, slowing of conduction with the prematurity. 
And so that makes it harder. So if you see a sudden change from, let's say, going from 320 to 310 or 300, 330 to 320, you see a change in QRS morphology that gives you, uh, most often it changes from uh, non-selective to left septal capture. Occasionally you can see from non-selective to selective capture. So in this example, um, I'm trying to, uh, maybe I'm overreading. If you look at the his electrogram on the his proximal lead, um, there is retrograde his potential. And in fact, in 310 also, there is a retrograde his potential. Do you agree? Or it's, sometimes there are so many deflections, it's hard to see. On the, so it, the conduction time, this is very short. On the proximal electrogram, if you come down, the sharp signal on the within 30 milliseconds of the stimulus artifact. It's immediately after the stimulus. Yeah, that one. So that is there in the previous beat also. If you see the previous beat, no, not not yeah that one, but also 600 milliseconds on the premature beat. Yeah. So I'm not sure if that is a conduction system capture and it's actually changing from non-selective to selective. And you can also see that by looking at your local electrogram on the uh, left frontal branch spacing lead, how that changes a little bit uh, differently compared to the previous beat versus the last three ten milliseconds. So it can be harder to interpret it, but if you see that change at uh, in ten millisecond decrement, then that's helpful to see it. Yes. Yes, 12 lead would be better, and looking at LV activation time also would be better to look at it as a whole when you do program smush. And as uh, mentioned, we like to do this when we're not able to demonstrate non-selective to selective or non-selective to um, the LV septal capture. It's more to convince ourselves that we are in the left frontal branch. But if all of the other criteria meets, we don't need this. Um, it's often helpful when you have left frontal branch block, there are no potentials, and there's no transition during uh, threshold testing. Uh, and your peak LV activation times may not always be uh, under uh, 80 milliseconds. This um, specificity is good, but the sensitivity is not as there. It's not been fully validated, but that's what we use at this point. Uh, in cardiomyopathy patients, when there is LVH and significant dilatation, the peak LV activation time can be beyond 80 milliseconds, and we use a cutoff of 90 milliseconds at times to uh, use that to convince ourselves. But you want proof that there is conduction system capture, especially if you're using left frontal pacing as an alternative before trying by v pacing. If you use it as a first-line approach, um, you want to give the patient the best option because we don't know if left septal pacing alone will be adequate theoretically. So those are the things that uh, you have to uh, ask yourself as you do these procedures. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So when are you going to do the 100th case and uh, going to throw us a party? Just that three days back, I'm not included in the data. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. What is the youngest stage you have done this case? For the, like left funded business? Sir? Youngest stage? Sir? Sir? I'm not a. Youngest you. patient. Youngest patient. Age wise. Age was 12 years, sir. 12 years. 12 years. 12 years. Any specific challenges in younger patients? I think that the W pattern will not be seen like I was telling. If there is a, if there is a good septal uh, uh, connection, like in young patients uh, or those patients who had a sinus syndrome, you are planning uh, AB, AB, this uh, ventricular pacing, where you will expect an absolutely normal septum, the condition will be so fast that you will not be able to see the W pattern there. But the most important thing is to measure the septal thickness uh, uh, before the procedure so that you should not expose the lead tip into the LV cavity. So that the measurement of septal thickness is adequate and you have to be make sure that your lead tip is not exposed there. So always see the unipolar impedance, if possible, even do a, a, an echo uh, if you want to confirm that your lead is not in, so the inside the left ventricular cavity before closing the pocket. 
and regarding the loop uh, probably you can just give an additional uh, uh, loop rather than giving an alpha loop because i don't know i'm not done in patients less than 10 years uh, if giving an alpha loop is uh, uh, it's, it's it may not be a good thing to have because it might tend to pull out the lead so what i did was i just gave a somewhat additional loop more than what we give for adults and uh, and close the procedure uh, probably we need to have some sort of consensus data to decide whether alpha loop has to be given or not i know i've experienced before okay. okay if you use twitter as no a specific question yeah please yeah, yeah please there, there are a few cases um i think mentioned on yes. twitter uh from yes. your uh 12 and 13 kg i don't see the age uh, mentioned i think i saw one patient 8 year old that they had done um, i have no experience under 16 so yeah those are specific question from dr ram kumar uh question is like this at what levels and which views do you usually check the interventricular septal thickness prior to the procedure we usually uh, do it in all three views uh, parasternal uh, sorry uh, parasternal long axis short axis and apical fourth chamber so i usually take uh, the maximum thickness into account and i'll make sure that my lead will be just 1 mm less than that so suppose if 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 it is like around uh, 10 to 11 11 mm if you let us assume that the septal septal thickness is 11 mm and then uh, probably we can take 1 mm uh, into account for the obliquity so what we can do is we can make at least that uh, 10.8 mm of the helix plus the interlectrode part into the septal thickness except into the interventricular septum so that is how we usually go but probably we can see in all the three views and uh, take a uh, take uh, probably the maximum number into account uh, as such uh, uh, there is no guideline data to suggest that you have to see in this particular view only but uh, what i usually do is i see in all three chain three, three views yeah so that that's you look at that's a uh, important uh, question because uh, the septal thickness is a rough guide um but well, you still have to go by the interprocedural parameters so what it gives us is that you, you're not surprised by seeing a patient with 18 mm thickness left ventricular hypertrophy so you don't still get your pattern even though the lead is 15 mm in so it it gives you a greater appreciation of how much more you may have to go that's one and secondly if you're not perpendicular you may go a lot more into the septum but still haven't reached the lv and cardiac surface so the pacing criteria the impedances and the one thing that um, i don't know if shanmugam sundar mentioned which i would like to uh, emphasize when assessing whether you have reached the lv and cardiac surface or perforated is looking at the unipolar electrogram and the imp uh, and the injury current on it so the st elevation on the uh, unipolar electrogram is probably the most valuable because when you lose that in the paste electrogram then the entire screw the electrical active electrode is intraventricular then you get a far field looking electrogram without uh, any injury current on the electrodes so the lead and low, is, and low impedance yeah the low impedance will accompany that sometimes you get below 500 i know you emphasize quite a bit on the 500 ohms and while i don't have an absolute number i'm nervous when it's below 500 but i i always look at the injury current and make sure that the threshold is less than 1 um but again some caveat there when there is significant injury current in about 10% of patients uh you will have very high threshold and you may you may worry have i perforated that the threshold is high but if there's injury current that usually it comes down it may take time maybe i have to wait 10 15 minutes before uh the threshold gets to under 1 and a different patient that can vary so those little bit of differences in patient characteristics like you see with rv septal or right atrial pacing lead placement and when you have a lot of injury current the threshold may take a lot longer to come down and you know to accept it as long as you see the injury current so similarly you have to watch for that here i i have a question uh, yes ma'am yeah so uh, ss i just want to ask uh, with your 100 patient experience we know this lead is still in uh, 
uh, has a lot of questions to answer but in your 100 patient yeah. experience how many uh, delayed uh, through and through for the septum uh, lv you have seen not on the table but delayed i mean afterwards the patients have come in and the same question is to dr vijay raman also because his experience is much more than anybody uh, on this call at the moment so i just need to understand about that lead more uh, how does it behave in the long term and how many times you have seen it going through the septum at a delayed le- uh, level late lead dislodgement due to the lv cavity uh, i have not seen in my uh, series uh, because uh, with the, uh, we'll be very particular about the lead numbers while doing the procedure and i, I have probably perforated around 9 to 10 times 10 uh, cases uh, while doing the procedure on the table so we'll recognize on the table and we we'll try to reposition it some other it at some other side rather than just simply throwing it but uh, in, in in my follow up patients i have not seen any lead dislodgement into the lv cavity so uh, yeah. yeah we've done close to uh, 300 patients or so uh, in the last 2 years and uh, in our series in our patients i haven't seen any late lead perforation but that's probably the most worrisome uh, complication thankfully it hasn't panned out as we worried about it uh, but what we have seen is uh, unlike his bone pacing at least in our center the lead dislodgement rate the macro dislodgement falling in back into the rv cavity i've seen probably five times so far so in the beginning there was some learning curve to it uh, in lead adjustments like uh, SS was saying that you don't just withdraw so the first few things as we had just pulled back and accepted it because the numbers were great and the next day the lead had fallen out into the RV side so so that is a concern so the lead has no anchoring mechanism because you have burrowed through the septum and you have basically cored the myocardium and the screw is not attached to any particular fiber it's just sitting in a, a little bit of a tunnel like structure there and thankfully for the vast majority of patients that remains stable but a the higher risk for lead dislodgement because of that uh, compared to his bone pacing or but the number is not very high if you follow some of the basic uh, principles so you know it's about 2% so far what we've seen and one other uh, point i want to emphasize is that the second thing that i worry about when i do um septal pacing so the three major issues that we need to understand is one is the perforation risk the second is the risk for tricuspid valve impinge- impingement so that's something because you're just moving the sheath from proximal to distal and you can uh, trap the septal leaflet or cardae and cause a tricuspid uh, regurgitation so i've seen it at least in one case in our series and so that had forced us to routinely check echocardiogram post procedure and that will at least identify those tricuspid regurgitation and then follow them closely so if you have to revise the lead sooner you do it so that's one uh, word of caution the second thing that i also do is that while it's easy to move from the his location and a little bit distal my approach would be to use a wire get the sheet further deep into the septum and then pull back towards the point where we want so you want to get out of the septal leaflet go under the or beyond the valve and then come back so that way you're not going to pin uh, trap the septal leaflet so that would be a simple procedural modification to make sure you can catch it the second thing is as you go beyond the uh, his region if you are on when you first fix the lead the first rotation to identify the spot and fix the lead slightly so that you can bring the sheath close to the tip when you do that look at the characteristic of the electrogram and your electrogram should be at least 5 millivolts and there should be some degree of injury current and if you don't see it before you start fixing it's likely that you are on the valve surface so you're not getting myocardial injury and the electrograms are smaller so that's another clue that you don't want to start uh, fixing the lead there because if you fix the lead then you may trap the leak like um this is just my procedural thoughts why uh, i watch for these things 
And the last one is, of course, we don't know about lead extraction risks and other things. And as far as the lead perforation issue, I've heard of one case, at least in the United States, it's a late perforation, and none of the predictors of uh, perforation was there. Everything was done according to a friend of mine who had done. And so uh, there's at least one case that is out there. But recognize, because during follow-up, any change in threshold in these leads should be viewed seriously. Then analyzed carefully to make sure that, uh, identify whether it's, so if the threshold is high and you still have right bundle branch pattern, more likely that it displaced into the LV side. The threshold is high and it has a left bundle branch spacing pattern and it's dislodged into the RV side. So at least that's a simple criteria we use. So it's important to have a 12 VDCG or a V1 at least to ensure that you pay attention in the staff who does the device follow. -up. So that's important. So it's a little more nuances in assessing these patients, but it's critical to identify uh, any uh, perforation or dislodgement issues. Yeah. There are some questions on the chat. Uh, Dr. Namudri, are you there? Yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah, one question is that uh, what is your experience of left bundle pacing in ischemic cardiomyopathy? Patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy. Uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy again. The problem is that uh, septal scar. So uh, most of the time it will be an angioval MA where uh, the proximal septum will be severely scarred. And uh, yeah, I've done uh, two cases with uh, uh, complete heart blocks, antral MA, LV dysfunctions, uh, uh, could do it. And uh, one more ischemic cardiomyopathy, I've done uh, 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 using a uh, uh, large CRGD, so where I have to put additional uh, CS lead. And uh, it's, I usually avoid choosing this ischemic cardiomyopathy because of the septal scar. Anyway, it, it's, all, it's all selective. So if it is ischemia, then it's better to go with the CS backup rather than just simply relying on the left bundle lead alone. And uh, if at all possible, get an MRI done, see whether uh, the target area is going to be the target area. Somebody is asking what is the target area. So it is just one to one and a half centimeter below the tricuspid valve in the apical four chamber view. So if that area is scarred, then probably uh, our success rate is going to be minimal. Uh, then uh, we may end up in uh, putting a conventional CRT there. Is it on, sir? Experience. Yeah, so that's a important thing. So most of the data that's out there uh, from China and Dr. Wong's lab is a lot of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy patients, patients who generally do well with biventricular pacing also. Um, and so we have a large series that we've put together and SS is part of it. We'll be presenting uh, in two weeks in HR, the cancel HRS meeting, um, virtual uh, presentation as a late breaker. So we'll share some of the experiences in a couple of weeks. But just as a general outline, uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy patient, we were successful in a fair number of patients, um, greater than 80, 85%, something like that. But if we look at the outcomes, they're not going to be as good as a dilated cardiomyopathy patient. So non-ischemics obviously fare better. So in the bigger scheme of things, uh, left bundle branch pacing or ismal pacing is is a good alternative to biventricular pacing. And in select patient, maybe better than that, but we don't have a lot of proof yet. So we need to build uh, those proofs for the future. Yeah, another question from Dr. Ram Kumar. Uh, two questions. One, do you uh, do cardiac MRI prior to procedure in all? And the second question is, how do you assess for distal conduction system disease, distal conduction system disease prior to left bundle pacing? Is there any electrocardiographic pattern or something that can, in which case, this would work better than the others? Any comments, Sean? Sir, cardiac MRI, I've never done a single cardiac MRI in my patients before the procedure. So it's all okay. a cardiographic assessment. And if I'm not able to uh, uh, screw the lead, uh, despite uh, all the available supportive measures, uh, 
then I would presume that it may be a scar which is not allowing me to put the lead in. And especially in uh, uh, cardiomyopathy patients, uh, we usually observe uh, the initial two or three millimeter will go in. But in the mid myocardial part, there will be some problem. So if you use some sort of maneuvers to, to, to just cross that mid myocardial area, the lead will just jump into that uh, left ventricular subendocardial region. So it's in the cardiomyopathy patients predominantly of, uh, especially non ischemic cardiomyopathy patients, predominantly of a mid myocardial scar. Where the initial 2-3 millimeters will go easily, the next 3-4 millimeters is going to be tough, then it will jump into the left side of the IVS. And uh, MRI, of course, it's, it will help, but again, the cost of the procedure will go up. It adds at least 7,000 to 10,000 to the total procedure cost. So I'm not doing uh, MRIs, but I think it's a good choice to do MRI at least in patients uh, for whom uh, cardiac, this uh, revascular resynchronization therapy is planned, CRT is planned. But it's a good choice to look for the scar. And uh, regarding the second second question, what is the second question? Yeah, that is assumption yeah. of conduction yeah. system. This is just yeah, to the point of conduction. Yeah, if the LBVB is fits in uh, star state area, it is more of a, a it's more of a correctable LBVB where the problem will be in the proximal bulk. And uh, otherwise, uh, it's very difficult to guess it from the surface itself whether we are going to succeed or not. So if it fits in the typical LVV criteria, of course, uh, it, 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 it means that probably we are in, especially in a, a female with a borderline dilatation of the LV uh, with a typical LVV pattern, we'll be able to uh, do the procedure without any problem. Uh, but if it is some sort of atypical variety where you see here and there some R wave in V1, Q wave in V1 and AVL, so if it is not fitting in typical uh, LVV pattern where you can uh, suspect some sort of IVCD, you may not be able to success. Uh, but apart from STARS criteria, uh, any other criteria for uh, assessing the success rate, it's like, uh, uh, I don't know, it's anybody's guessing game. Jeram, sir, uh, can provide some answer. Yeah, so I, I think uh, the, the, the MRI, uh, I mean, 7,000 sounds very cheap. Uh, U.S., it's so much more expensive. So I don't do it routinely, and I haven't done it as a precursor for the implants. Occasionally, maybe I have a couple of patients where CRT failures from bivy pacing when we come for left bundle pacing, and I've done it. Um, so it, the, the scar is there. Our presumption is that it's challenging and harder, and I, I don't know. More often in severe cardiomyopathies, is the inability to get the sheath and the lead at perpendicular and ability to support to penetrate the septum has been our challenge too. Uh, target the septum. So penetration has been a challenge rather than the scar itself preventing it, at least my experience. Um, the second uh, question that's important is that uh, what do you do, how do you assess um, what type of vernal branch flux? So our approach is always place the lead in the his, find a distal his, spend a few minutes there, and pace to see if you correct. So if I correct uh, the left vernal branch pattern by his pacing, of course, we may miss 10, 20% of uh, correctable left bone branch block, but we pace at a very high output, 10 at one, and see if it corrects it, then I think left bone branch pacing uh, would work best, better than anything else, so we would go from there. But once you do left bone branch pacing, in some of those patients where you don't correct, no matter where you try in the his bundle, and then you go and you find potentials. So in a patient with left bone branch block, you see uh, left bundle potential, and that's a sign that it's a distal disease. It's more more likely IVCD, so it's a diffuse conduction disease. And invariably, the pace cures duration is not narrow; it's fairly wide, and we don't know if that's the right step, and we don't know if it's going to be any better than by pacing. So my approach of those patients would be uh, IV pacing probably is a better choice in those patients. And if necessary, and even by pacing, at least um, anecdotally, the pace cure is fairly wide. We don't know what it means. So sometimes we combine in those patients where we can combine, we use um, left septal and uh, FB coronary sinus pacing in those patients. And I saw it's one question on the chat, left. so I want to uh, yeah. uh, answer that. One question is that. Um, where do I find the injury current when I was talking about uh, before fixing the lead? So I was talking about the electrogram from the pacing lead. So the unipolar electrogram that you're looking at, 
uh, I want to look for uh, R waves greater than 5 millivolts, and I want to have some injury current in before I start penetrating the septum. Because if there's no injury current, then it's likely that you're on a valve surface or you're not under uh, perfect opposition to the wall. So those are what I meant. Uh, shall I go ahead with the Dr. Dr. Vijay Raman, is there any type of... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, is there any type of left pundi branch block where you will not consider uh, this, uh, this treatment a priori? I mean, any type of left pundi? So, I mean, we, we, can always, we, we can guess going in, and uh, this maybe I see Wula has a question about what is my primary approach for CRT. So, um, I mean, it depends on the patients, too. I try to explain all the options in the U.S. given by me is um, it's the main approved therapy. So, I present the options to all of them and tell them that we're going to have all three options, his left bundle and CS. And whichever gives me the best electrical synchronization is what I'm going to do. And because it's easy to start with the hiss, I start with the hiss always. And so even including what type of left bone run, it doesn't matter what kind of conduction disease. I start with the hiss, gives me a good idea uh, whether this is going to be correctable. And then uh, based on the threshold required to correct it, in some patients you get great numbers. Uh, the disease is more in the proximal his, and I would stop with the his lead there. And if the thresholds now, I have a cutoff of 1.5 volts to 2 volts for correction of left one. It has to be under that to accept a his lead. Um, so then we go to the left bundle at that point. Um, and CS is always in the play. So if I'm not happy, that's why I mentioned, uh, for me, I have to ensure that I'm giving the best option for the patient. Um, whether there is left frontal branch capture, whether you have adequate cures narrowing, no specific criteria, but looking at the peak activation time and other things, are we achieving what we think we want to achieve? Just left septal pacing alone uh, may not be the best option for many patients, so you have to go with what is standard of care. And unless you have clear proof, at least for your justification, that you've got achieved the maximum electrical synchrony. So then CS will be our, my second choice. And uh, if I'm not happy with the CS, we don't accept any um, short QLV type of uh, locations, high thresholds, and then you always have easy to fall back into the left bundle option in those patients. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, any change in the approach because of the very thick septum? So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, my experience is limited. We have a few patients. Uh, it can be challenging, but uh, often I find that the if they're not severely fibrotic, again, it is uh, uh, anecdotal and I'm just postulating. Most of the time, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the lead actually goes in fairly easily. And I've seen people post on Twitter up to 30 millimeters um, of septum. So I don't know what it means, what's the long-term implication of it. Um, so I would do that only if I feel that that's the best option for the patient. So you have to balance the risk versus benefits. Implantation is not that much of a challenge, at least anecdotally. Shall I finish the second half of the talk, sir? It takes another 15 minutes. Oh, sorry, I didn't know. So you can if um, people have time, and if you want to finish, that's perfect. Saksena, sir, shall I? Shall I? Yeah, sure. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'll just uh, share some of the cases. Interesting cases uh, are somewhat uh, not exactly challenging cases. So there are some three or four uh, interesting complete art block uh, LBVP. Uh, just share some of the few cases. So this uh, 65 years old uh, female with a complete heart block revived of a sudden cardiac death, was put on a ventilator, was on TPS. This was the rhythm to begin with. So it was based for them. Uh, the pace QRS is around uh, 157 milliseconds. So we... Yeah. 
So this this is the uh, uh, intracardiac signal. Uh, usually begin with putting a uh, one catheter from the groins, which is uh, not always an ideal procedure too because you are putting one more catheter. It's uh, increasing the cost of the procedure. But still, I used to put one more catheter from the groin. But you can see this is the hismal catheter. Uh, you can see the A, and uh, this is the H, and this is the V. So this is the native. I switched off the TPA. You can see the native is going on. It is relatively an narrow QRS rhythm. The QRS is around 126. And uh, there is more of an H block. You can see the H is seen here before every uh, B. But what happened when you see that fractionated A signals, you could see some sort of Hisbanal signal there after every A. So this means that there is an A, there is an H, and uh, probably there is a block, and there is one more H task to see that uh, V wave. So that means that the level of uh, block is. Uh, Yeah, the level of uh, uh, block is somewhere around uh, here in the in the mid of the his bundle. So uh, still this portion of the his bundle is variable for pacing. So based on this signal alone, probably we could judge that his bundle pacing uh, will work beautifully in this case. Because we have a large area to target, probably uh, uh, at least one or two minutes to target to look for a good uh, his bundle capture. But just like this uh, uh, red fibers, I was pleading for uh, putting a left bundle lead. So I put a left bundle lead, and uh, I got a beautiful uh, left bundle signal. So that means that the top, please, the level of uh, block is somewhere uh, here, and uh, I, this uh, this signals from the left bundle potential is because of the ectopic or whatever it is, the rhythm is coming from this distal distal uh, bundle and producing the. Uh, is, uh, left bundle potential. So you can see the lead deep in the system, and you can see all the features of uh, uh, characteristic left bundle uh, pacing. So by analyzing the intracardiac uh, uh, electrograms, you'll be able to see exactly where the block is there, and probably we can decide whether his bundle will work. In this case, uh, it's worth uh, uh, trying for his bundle or to straight away go for left bundle. This is the second case where you can see uh, probably a relatively a narrow QRS with a complete heart block. And the QRS morphology is of uh, right bundle branch uh, block. So with a relatively narrow QRS, though we could judge uh, that it may be at the level of uh, AV node, but with the right bundle branch block morphology, I thought the block may be uh, in the infra ACN region. So I put a uh, uh, groin catheter. You can see A, H, and uh, V separately. And uh, this uh, probably will tell that the level of block will be in the distal is bundle region because it is a HP block. So I straight away went ahead with putting a lead in the left bundle, and putting the lead in the left bundle produced one more uh, potential just if we proceeding the ventricular electrogram. So this means that the level of block is probably just prior to the uh, origin of the left bundle fiber, so that uh, uh, the uh, escape impulse or whatever impulse is uh, coming, it is coming just proximal to the left bundle, just proximal to the left bundle origin. That means that. Even if you are going to search all along this bundle area, we will not be able to correct this form of complete heart block because the level of the block is very distant. So in this case, instead of trying for his bundle, probably we can try for his bundle, but a left bundle will be a better option rather than putting a his bundle. So this is one good thing to look for potentials before going ahead with either his bundle or left bundle basic. So this patient had a QR of around 100 milliseconds with an LVAT of 65. Uh, this uh, his alone will not uh, would not have produced a good result here. So this is a third patient with again a complete heart block. Uh, TP was there. You can see the level of block is uh, probably the infra ACN region. You can see the block is in the H3 level. So I can expect a block probably in the distributed his bundle. I put a his bundle uh, left bundle lead there. But what interesting thing I could see is that you can see some sort of potentials here and there after the ventricular electrogram. So all these are nothing but this R. TPA is basic from the RV apex. I can see the HP block here, and my lead is there. This means that the RV paced impulse is going retrorally via the left bundle, and that is producing some sort of potentials at the end of the ventricular electron. So this is nothing but a retrograde left bundle potentials, which can be demonstrated in patients with a complete heart block. So this is very difficult to demonstrate the retrograde left bundle potential. So I was lucky to have this in uh, just a single case. I don't know whether it is uh, consistently reproducible or not, but if you are observing this retrograde left bundle potential, that again it assures that 
you have captured the bundle selectively. So here again, LVAT was good around 63 milliseconds. I got a QR of around 110 milliseconds. So these are the ways to confirm that you are capturing the uh, left bundle in patients where you don't have any anti-grade activation of the left bundle. The second group of patients, RBVB corrections. So RBV, LBVB corrections, we know that uh, LBB pacing can correct the LBVB. The RBV correction have done two good cases of DTM RBV correction where uh, both the patients had an EF of around 25 to 30 percentage. This was a base into them. And luckily, both of them had HV prolongation, indicating that there was an associated conduction system disease. So initially, I tried uh, his bundle. The his bundle QRS was around 170 milliseconds. I got a good uh, his bundle signals. But uh, since I was not happy with the threshold, the threshold was very high at 2.5 volt, it was correct. I tried the left bundle and I could uh, get a good left bundle potentials with the duration of around 25 milliseconds to surface QRS. And the ECG was uh, almost like a normal ECG with just an R prime pattern in the lead V1. And uh, we could demonstrate an improvement in the ejection fraction in this particular patient where the baseline EF was around 28 to 30 percentage that had improved with the negative remodeling to around 45 percentage at the end of two months. So I with that results, one more DCM RBV correction was done. Again, uh, a young patient with uh, uh, EF of around 30 percentage. So this case, uh, uh, I straight away went ahead with the left bundle pacing and see the sharp left bundle potential here. The QRS, we got a good QRS of around 100 milliseconds. So with the dual chamber pacemaker alone, both these cases responded well, and we could demonstrate an increase in ejection fraction from uh, less than 30 percentage to 45 percentage plus. So this is one thing which is is challenging correcting an RBVB with the CRT. We know that the indication of CRT is uh, the, probably the use of CRT is not as good as compared to LBBB. So this uh, physiological pacing, of course, his we have to try with the RBVB because RBVB is uh, one thing where uh, I think we should try his first in all cases to correct it. So only if it is not correctable, then probably we can go down and see whether we can capture the left bundle. So if it is working well, then probably it is uh, one good solution for those cohort of patients where uh, CRT is not working well. Of course, uh, like I was talking, if uh, LBBB is not being corrected by left bundle, we can always get the help of uh, the CS lead, like in this case where uh, there was a predominant ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, with a documented VD, scarred LAD territory. It was a tough time to screw the left bundle lead. So left bundle alone produced a QRS duration of almost 130, 30, sorry, sorry, 35 milliseconds. I had to put one more CS lead and uh, paste it together. So one CS lead was also in, the QR has just come down to around 115 milliseconds, and we could again demonstrate some sort of improvement in the ejection fraction from 35 to almost 40 percent plus at the end of one month. So we can always utilize the CS lead if you are not able to correct your uh, uh, bundle branch block morphology by LBBB alone. So it, either it can be a uh, uh, CS plus uh, uh, left bundle lead or left bundle plus RB septal lead in some cases like I was pointing out in the previous slides or it can be a combination of all these three things together where you have to use DF1 uh, CRTD pacing. Of course, 3D inspired from Dr. Ulla sir, I tried a case of 3D guided uh, uh, left bundle branch pacing where entire anatomy was created from the groin uh, uh, with a quadripolar catheter and uh, the puncture was taken uh, without using fluoro and once the sheath was in along with the lead in the right atrium, used transient fluoro just to re reach the right ventricle, to reach the right spot do did a pace mapping to get a uh, W pattern in the lead V1, then started screwing it, got a good QRS of around 110 milliseconds. So this uh, fluoroless technique or DF0 fluoro uh, left bundle batch pacing will be of some use in reducing the radiation exposure. And just to conclude, uh, probably a little comparison between his bundle and left bundle. So it is the most physiological form of pacing. Here there is a theoretical risk of LVRV dyssynchrony. You can get the narrowest QRS in his bundle, you can get a good QRS in a left bundle. Selective pacing will be better with the left bundle as compared to his bundle where we're getting predominantly of a non-selective. And um, there we'll be mapping the his region directly. Here we are using uh, probably uh, indirectly that W pattern in the uh, lead movement from the RD side. So there it is a narrow target, here it is a wide target. The threshold will be better. The dislodgement rate will be better. The late rising threshold will be better with the left bundle. Of course, the battery life depends on the threshold and the sensing will be better. But the lead extraction data is available only for his bundle so far. The left bundle doesn't have any lead extraction data. Clinical response, both are uh, uh, having a good response as compared to CRT. Bundle branch correction block 
will be better with left bundle as, as compared to his bundle. So both can be combined together with a CSD to produce either hot CRT or a lot CRT. Of course, his bundle is technically challenging. You need to know uh, the uh, entire mapping uh, area in detail to get a good uh, successful his bundle pacing. But this is technically a little easier uh, where you just have to place the lead deep septally and you have to do certain manuals to confirm the capture. The limitations, of course, dilated atria is a big uh, limitation for Rismond pacing. Here, the presence of basal septal scar is, uh, of course, a big problem in doing the bundle pacing. So, before concluding, I would like to thank all these three persons in the screen Dr. Parikshit, who actually was traveling frequently to India to teach uh, uh, the physiological pacing, and Vijayaman sir, I have learned a lot from him. And Ulla sir, actually, I have to thank him a lot for uh, introducing and learning this therapy. Thank you. Dr. Namudri, Dr. Vijayaraman. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. So I said this was a very nice uh, presentation and summarizing uh, slides on conduction system pacing for heart block. So our early experience showed us that uh, in in complete heart block patient, when we did hispanal pacing, even though you see HV block majority of those cases, at least that time, we felt that 75% of those HV blocks were all intrahisian blocks because we were able to correct even facing proximal to the cytal block. With the current knowledge gain, as uh, SS was showing, that you can see distal conduction intact when you face from the left bundle region. So my uh, experience right now is that about 95% of these blocks are all in the his proximal or distal his region rather than peripheral conduction block. Of course, there are a small number of patients with diffuse conduction disease and from proximal to distal his region when they develop heart block. So, non cardiomyopathy patients. So, I think conduction system pacing is probably feasible close to very close to 100% of these patients with AV block except for those rare uh, channelopathies and other congenital uh, heart blocks and different, not congenital heart block, congenital heart disease related, surgical related uh, heart blocks and other issues. So majority of them you should be able to correct with conduction system pacing. Excellent presentation, good uh, discussions. Um, is there any other particular questions anybody have that we can address? And there was one question about stylet-driven leads. Well, there are a few that has been done uh, outside. I haven't uh, tried any with a, a stylet-driven leads. Little concern is that um, the surface area for the larger French size lead compared to the four French versus seven French leads. And if you attempt multiple times, uh, are we causing more damage? Of course, we are causing limited myocardial injury uh, by doing left bone branch pacing. And would we cause more trouble in these patients? So those are things that makes me nervous about doing with those leads. Um, but we have to learn more uh, from that perspective. One other question I see is about QT prolongation. When you correct left bundle branch block, you do see some QT prolongation, mostly due to T-wave memory changes, and that usually resolves within two to six weeks. Dr. Saxena. Uh, yeah, hi. Well, thank you so much. Any other questions uh, from you? Or? I think uh, the presentation was excellent, and, and thank you for being with us. It's been a pleasure, and we hope to continue our association with the diaspora. So thank you, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you for having yeah. me. Appreciate it. Yeah, Dr. Vijayaraman, I just have one question here. Uh, do you have more leads coming in except for the chronic leads? Are they uh, in process? Are they coming? So from what uh, my interaction with the industry is that everyone is hesitant to develop a new lead for whatever business reasons. Um, 
both St. Jude and Medtronic have better <coughs> prototype leads available, but they haven't made the business decision to uh, put it into trials and get it to market. That is not being seen. And from Boston Scientific and Biotronic, they've been focusing more on sheath delivery sheath. for his bundle pacing. So the industry hasn't moved towards left bundle branch pacing, but they're watching carefully. I think the more data we generate, and uh, I think India can generate a fair amount of data for CRT, which the industry may not like, because you are dumbing it down to a dual chamber device, which is not good for the pocket, but great for our patients. I think we need to develop the data and prove that that's adequate for resynchronization therapy. Um, and those things will push them to develop better tools. I think we need to push them, push the industry to develop better tools, and show that the conduction system pacing will be the way to go for the future. On one note, one of the concerns is that the lead wasn't designed for deep septal pacing. So um, Medtronic is working on assessing um, stress testing to see what is the uh, point for lead failure. And so the bench testing so far from what I have seen looks good that this lead can withstand uh, left bone branch pacing. All the rotations that we give, all the stress points with the tip and the ring uh, stuck in the middle of the septum. So those things look promising that the time to failure uh, will be less and 99% survival for stress-related uh, lead failures from this patient. So what we do need more data, long-term data. So anybody who does these cases should track and maybe if uh, the leaders of the IHRS can initiate a registry and then you can really bring up a large database very quickly. And I think that would be a be wonderful quite thing valid. to do. Yeah. Pugal, is there is there some hesitancy in the industry about developing new leads? Is the process has become more complicated, and everybody seems to be hesitant about the, both ICDs and and patient leads. They are not trying to develop new leads. Yeah. So that's a, so that is the um, what should I say that's the official position of most of these companies is that right. difficult to develop, but that is not the truth. The truth is they haven't been wanting this to succeed. At least this is my perception. I don't want to. <laughs> okay. uh, because the, their efforts have been, the last several years, uh, have been on leadless. They've invested uh, quite a lot of money in leadless technology. So this has been a uh, disruption, actually. So what we have done with the HISAR left on branch facing is a major disruption to the industry plans. That's why they're not promoting. See, there's no trials, no support to do major studies. And while you have so many hundreds of trials on CRT therapies, uh, a lot more money put in that. So it's, it's the lack of industry's willingness to get this to the oh. next level. So I think we can push the industry. So if we generate enough data, and it, it gets, I mean, this has come into the guidelines to some extent, but if if India can generate so much more data on left front branch basically for CRT and bradycardia, I mean, that can become the standard. So we can collect data of thousands of patients within a few years if uh, the training is there and more people are doing this. So great for our patients, hopefully. Wonderful. I think uh, Dr. Shan, you have Please. done a wonderful job. Uh, thanks. Uh, and thanks, Dr. Vijay Raman, also. On behalf of the society, we thank both of them, both of you. So, should we stop, Dr. Manita? Anything more? Yes. I think, Anil, we have done good. We can all enjoy a good cup of tea after okay. this. Yeah, so much. Thank okay. You. Thank you so thank much, you. Dr. Vijay Raman. Thanks, 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 thank thank Mudri. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. Sir. you. Sir. Bye. 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 Bye.